Welcome back to this event organized by the University of Leeds and entitled Learning uh, in Inclusive Knowledge Societies After COVID-19. And it's my great pleasure to be here as the Joint Director of the University Centre for Disability Studies. And it's my honour and pleasure to introduce my colleague, um, Professor Roger Slee, who is going to talk to us today about disability and belonging in an age of exclusion. And I'd just like to say some introductory words about Roger that will probably make him blush. So Roger is a world-renowned expert in the field of inclusive education, founder and editor-in-chief of the leading journal in this field, the International Journal of inclusive education. And also recently, he has been responsible for launching an exciting new journal um, called the Journal of Disability Studies in Education. And we do invite people to check out both of those publications. His work on the philosophy, on the policies and the practices of inclusive education has quite simply entered the canon. I'm a particular fan of his book, now in its second edition, entitled The Irregular School, which challenges us all as educators to think differently, to be differently, and to do, to practice differently as educators, so that we can ensure that all young people can and do flourish. He has, across his career, called for us to think about uh, fundamental school and educative uh, reform rather than kind of tittling around the edges of, of the existing systems and structures and has been a strong advocate of an innovative and we might even say aggressive concept of inclusion that makes sure that nobody, no child or young person is left behind. And he challenges us to think about education and schooling as an apprenticeship in democracy and a prerequisite for um, democratic education. So welcome, Roger. I'm now going to um, leave you to give your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annie Harrod. You, um, you have made me blush. Uh, and thank you, Michaelis and our colleagues in the School of Education for organising this important conference. Uh, I feel very grateful and very challenged uh, by the kind invitation uh, to participate. I feel challenged because the phrase learning in inclusive knowledge societies invites an ontological reckoning for what hitherto has been passed off as education for children with disabilities, um, seldom entertained by education policy makers. Notwithstanding the ubiquity of the discourse of inclusion, we live in a world more easily characterised by exclusion than by inclusion. Last year, at the height of the pandemic, the Director General of UNESCO, Audrey Osley, uh, reported that there were 290.5 million children out of school. And I'm guessing uh, that her data is radically incomplete. I don't think that it really embraces all of those invisible children. The discourse of inclusion cannot conceal the fact that conflict and exclusion are part of our global DNA. As the American author Tony Morrison so elegantly put it, why should we want to know the stranger when it's easier to estrange another? Why should we want to close the distance when we can close the gate? This presentation contributes three propositions, I hope, to today's reconsideration of education in the event of a time after COVID-19. First, COVID-19 obviously affects populations differentially, throwing into sharp relief the intersections of identity markers such as poverty, class, race, and ethnicity, geographic location and affiliation, and disability. Second, schooling as we know it has been the boiler room of inequality. 
the knowledge is articulated in and through its structures and programs perpetuate the exclusion of vulnerable population cohorts such as disabled children. Therefore, the achievement of inclusive knowledge societies demands different ways of knowing, organising and practising in the world. Third, and here is an injection, uh, if you'll forgive that phrase, of hope. Pandemic reveals the possibility of radical changes, the like of which were unimaginable some 18 months ago. We have an opportunity post or mid pandemic to confront ableism in education. If we could put up uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. In his recently published autobiography entitled B-Swing, Richard Thompson, uh, the founding member of British folk rock band Fairport Convention and an extraordinary guitarist, reflects upon the London of his childhood. And I think I need to break off here and apologise. Uh, only an Australian would um, uh, pay homage to London uh, in a presentation in Leeds. Uh, but... Richard Thompson writes, Then there is the dust of London. When my story begins in the 1960s, the fog is lifting a little. The choking smogs of my childhood, with visibility down to a yard, have been curtailed for the sake of public health by the Clean Air Act of 1956. The dust dirt and grime of a million coal flat fires, hundreds of steam trains and massive power stations is receding as they are slowly replaced by cleaner fuel. But I miss it. I miss the sulphurous fog that linked you to the London of Sherlock Holmes and Dickens that inspired visiting French impressionists to paint the city's blurred sunrises and sunsets and that made everything soft and mysterious. It was a part of London. It was a part of being a Londoner. I suppose even poison is something you can become fond of. Now, it's a tenu tenuous link, but it struck me that we have become so used to the pervasive poison of ableism in education across all sectors that we reach routinely fail to see it and name it for what it is. This is in large measure uh, being achieved by the institutional shifting of responsibility for the education of students with disabilities to the dominion of special education. There's a long-standing codependency between regular schooling and special schooling that legitimizes the consignment of difficult, different, defective, disruptive, disengaged and disabled students to the educational periphery so that schools can better manage increasingly diverse populations. For most of us, our reveries about childhood and schooling seldom su summon the toxicity of ableism in education. This is unsurprising, as ableism has long been wrapped in, concealed by, and practiced through the psychometric cellophane of special educational needs. Coined by Mary Warnock as an administrative category in her 1978 report of the Committee of Inquiry into the edu Education of uh, Handicapped Children and Young People, special educational needs is ubiquitous, saturating education discourse. We have special educational needs students, special educational needs teachers, and special educational needs coordinators, special educational programs, rooms, schools. Indeed, special educational needs is frequently held up as a centrepiece of inclusive education. I want to challenge this institutional formation as a part of a transition that's necessary in moving to learning in inclusive knowledge societies. In the 1990s in England, Barry Troyner pressed educators to consider the difference between multicultural uh, and anti-racist education. The liberal veneer of school multicultural days resplendent with saris, samosas and steel bands deflected from the deep structure of racism in education. The general reluct reluctance to acknowledge racism 
expressed itself in exclusions and the overrepresentation of Black British students in behaviour units and their reincarnation pupil referral units. At the risk of oversimplification, oversimplification let me suggest that in spite of, of, or perhaps as Sally Tomlinson suggests, because of the rapid expansion of special educational needs, disabled children have not experienced an inclusive education. And we will test this in the context of Australian education over the past uh, two decades. If we could go to the next uh, two uh, the next slide, please. And I want now to consider COVID-19 and education, albeit very briefly. And to do this, I want to offer a general observation about the pandemic. While the scale of the data has been overwhelming, disaggregation of the data to, relevant, to reveal differential impacts of COVID-19 is infrequent and has not built a necessary appreciation of the intersection of social and economic contingency in the scaling up of vulnerability. Tom Shakespeare and his colleagues recently reported in The Lancet in an article entitled Triple Jeopardy, Disabled People and the COVID-19 Pandemic, that people with disabilities have been differentially affected by COVID-19 because of three factors. First, the increased risk of poor outcomes from the disease itself. Second, reduced access to routine health care and rehabilitation. And third, the adverse social impacts of efforts to mitigate the pandemic. The Office of National Statistics in England reports that people with disabilities make up almost 60% of COVID-19 deaths in England, 60%. And people with disabilities represent 16% of the population. Pandemic amplifies traditional markers of inequality. Andrew Ma uh, noted last year that we aren't experiencing the crisis in the same way. And I take from his writing, being confront, confined in a high rise flat is dramatically worse than being limited to a big suburban house with a sunny spacious garden. The gap between those who might be expected to keep working on short term contracts in conditions that make social distancing difficult and those who can work from a new computer while sat at their kitchen table is a vast one. The generational, generational divide and the higher death rates for black, Asian and minority ethnic Britons are obvious divisions. Earlier this year, UNICEF highlighted the heightened educational risks for children with disabilities in Europe and Central Asia during pandemic. The, rep the report speaks of the multiplying effect of COVID-19 for children with disabilities. I want now to turn to schooling and inclusive knowledge societies. And rather than forensically detailing the evidence of the shortcomings in education for children with disabilities over the last two decades, let me suggest that a good pricey may be found in the evidence presented to a public hearing of the Australian Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability convened in April uh, 2019. A public hearing of that Royal Commission was held in Townsville from Monday 4th of uh, November to Thursday 7th of November 2019. This was the Royal Commission's first hearing at which evidence was taken to inquire into, first, inclusiveness in education as it relates to students with disability, and second, the implementation of existing policies and procedures relating to inclusive education of students with disability with a focus on the Queensland government education system. Amongst the issues identified by expert witnesses to the public hearing were the following, and I'll just um, summarise these uh, quickly for you. First was the practice of what's called gatekeeping, and gatekeeping refers to the practice where a school principal, a deputy principal, a school psychologist or administrator 
will actively try to prevent access to a school for a student with disability, suggesting that uh, the school down the road, the, um, the special school uh, in, in the, the next suburb uh, would be much more suitable uh, for the child's needs. Now, this practice contra contravenes the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992. And it was mentioned in the Deloitte Access Economics 19, uh, 2017 review of the experiences of children with disabilities in Queensland state schools. Another uh, issue cited was the overrepresentation in disciplinary absences and unique attendance schedules. And what they're referring to there is that uh, in data uh, concerning the exclusion and suspension of students, uh, students with disability uh, were much more likely to include, uh, to incur uh, what are called student disciplinary absences. Um, and again, uh, the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992 makes clear that a student must not be suspended or excluded for behaviour that is a consequence of their disability. Parents also reported uh, the widespread practices of schools setting an individual schedule of attendance for uh, children with disabilities. So the expectation is that they're not required to be at school uh, all week and specific classes and times are scheduled for them, uh, which can, again limits their access uh, to the curriculum. Uh, also mentioned was the lack of or unsuitability of reasonable adjustments. Uh, consistent with the uh, Disability Discrimination Act and the Disability Standards for Education in 2005, schools are required to make reasonable adjustments to enable children with disabilities to access and participate in the school curriculum and the school's activities. Parents of children with disabilities often report that such adjustments are not forthcoming or are not matched to the requirements of the child. Congregating children with disabilities across a range of ages in so-called inclusion rooms is frequently offered as a reasonable accommodation. We know that this amounts to segregation, albeit on site. Uh, parents also talked about bullying and mistreatment. And I can relate uh, this to you by um, telling you of uh, the Deloitte review that I mentioned. Uh, when we were gathering um, uh, data for that review, we interviewed um, numerous parents right across the state of Queensland. And it was interesting to hear um, parents saying to us that they uh, wanted their children to be educated inclusively in the neighbourhood school, uh, but that had not worked out and they had chosen uh, a special school. Um, and the reason for their choice, they stated, was that their child wouldn't be bullied in the special school and the child would receive uh, more of the teacher's time. F from my point of view, that really begs the question, uh, why do we allow our neighbourhood schools to be places where children with disabilities uh, are bullied? Uh, why isn't there uh, the provision of teacher time uh, sufficient to the needs of children? Um, I know that the you know, the implications of resources are significant, but uh, maintaining bifurcated systems uh, duplicates resources and is itself extremely expensive. Uh, people talked about restrictive practices, and here they were mentioning the exclusion of, of, of students or the seclusion, sorry, of students in timeout rooms uh, in Queensland, uh, the inquiry I spoke of uh, was prompted by uh, children being kept in what were basically storerooms uh, away from the class in the, in the Australian Capital Territory in a school in Canberra uh, 
a very significant issue arose when a school principal had had a cage built in uh, the storeroom uh, abutting a classroom so that a child with autism could be placed in the cage and still watch the class proceedings from that cage. The cage, um, quite cruelly, was called... Um, uh, uh, was called the um, the inclusion uh, room. People also mentioned issues of low expectations and underachievement of children with disabilities being widespread. Um, uh, also widespread was the question of inadequate uh, uh, training uh, uh, for teachers and school personnel. Um, Funding models were also cited, and uh, traditionally in Australia, we've had a situation whereby uh, the gravity of the funding model has created very perverse effects, uh, such that it has increased the number uh, and um, the extent of disablement uh, of, of children. Um, to be clearer about that, uh, the greater the level of disability, uh, the greater the funding that can be applied for. Um, so therefore, uh, it's been in people's interest to talk up what people can't do uh, rather than start from, uh, from strengths. Uh, complaint resolution uh, was uh, another area of... Um, of issue uh, um, mentioned uh, to the Royal Commission. Um, there has also been an increase. Sorry, Ang Harrod. Sorry, we can't hear you, Ang Harrod. Sorry, at the moment you're muted, I think. My apologies. I'm popping in as the chair to just gently remind Professor Slee, if you would, please, two minutes, because we want to leave time for a couple of questions, if we may. Sorry okay. to no. rush you. No, no. I'm loving hearing from you. That's OK. I'll just go to the third uh, 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 proposition, and that is that um, pandemic uh, has has made the possibility of of reform um uh you know much uh much more apparent uh and what i'm talking about is not simply uh the uh, as ang harrod mentioned it's not simply the um uh cosmetic changes to uh the structure of education but a rethinking of the way in which ableism has been articulated in the structure of, of an organisation of education, in its programs, in the structure and composition of the workforce, in teacher education, uh, in pedagogy and in curriculum. Um, so, during pandemic, we've seen the possibilities of changes that were were not contemplated before. Um, the traditional classroom uh, uh, has been evacuated, and we've seen its reconstruction online. Uh, this has simultaneously broadened and limited access. Long overdue institutional creativity has found its place. Pandemic has issued a threat to the very essence of our educational practices and demanded creativity and flexibility. Tackling the tradition of ableism in education requires this level of creativity, this level of flexibility to host inclusive knowledge and inclusive learning. Thank you. You're on mute. I'm very sorry. I'm not That's doing very well on the mute. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much, Roger. And now I know that we have some questions um, for you from the audience. 
And I think that one of them will be appearing on the screen now. So I wonder, I just um, read this out for everybody. Professor Slee, do you think that closure of special schools would end ableism in education? It's a good question. What do you think? Thanks, Anne Harrod. Um, and um, for that question, it is a good question. And mm -hmm. it it presses me to clarify things that I've said. Um, no is, is the answer. The closure of special schools will not in and of itself end ableism in education. Ableism is, is far more pervasive. I need also to say that um, I'm often characterised as demonising special education, and that's not my purpose. Right. Mm. Uh, special education in its inception uh, was a radical utterance, if you like. It was a, mm -hmm. a way of saying that uh, all children were educable, um, and that went against the grain. So in that way, it was radical. But it suited the, the needs of the regular education system to be able to divide and push out uh, many children. And and that has been a continu continuing problem. Plus, I think the notion that a segregated education is a valid education uh, for an inclusive society is fundamentally flawed. Um, uh, I think it was Jules Henry, the American educator, who said that an education in segregation is an education in social stupidity. Uh, we mm -hmm. can't pretend the world is as we want to create it, uh, devoid of certain population cohorts. Yeah. Um, so I think you know there are fundamental problems with special schools, but they're not of their own making in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, the unwillingness and incapacity of regular schools uh, to educate all comers is the problem that we should be thinking about. Thank you. Thank you very much.